But I'll tell you, it's a, it's, it's a one-of-a-kind feeling. You're surrounded by thousands of people. I kept my eye on the starter above because I wanted to make sure I knew exactly when he was ready. Well, now they're gathered for the start of the 93rd Boston Marathon. and toward Boylston Street, toward the Hancock Tower. But in 1897, at the first Boston Marathon, which started in Ashland, Tom Burke, the starter, took his boot, dug it in the dirt across the line, and said, gents, that's the starting line. <laughs> and 15 athletes went off, headed towards Boston. And the reason the course is out here, and you're seeing all these athletes out today, is they started west of the city because the train line came into Boston that way. And the officials started the race, got on the train, and then went down and checked everybody at Framingham, Natick, and all the way down. And now you're seeing the changes that have taken place. Here's a course map, and it starts in a southwesterly direction, a little bit below Boston. The wind at this time of the year, generally about 75% of the time, is at the runner's back. It's a southwest breeze coming into Boston much of the month of April. And you can see Boston right on the, on the coastline there, and they will finish up at just about sea level after starting very high up. There you see a map at 490 feet of elevation. I mentioned that this is a Greg Luganus course. Look what happens in the first couple of miles. You fall down to about 220 feet of elevation very quickly. And the first mile is sometimes covered at faster than 4 minutes and 30 seconds. Do you remember your first mile, Craig Virgin, 81? No, because I don't remember exactly what the split was, but it's very contagious. You have to be very careful, Bud Collins, that you don't go out too fast, because if you burn your wick, in the first two to six miles. It's a very horrible finish the last four or five months. This may scare you, this type of course, doesn't it? Because you're so fast through five and eight miles, you must have a fear component to cope with the rest of the race. Well, Larry, the main thing at the start is not to get tripped up. Obviously, they had a little altercation a couple of years ago in the confusion with the starting line and everything and not being dropped in the rope and everything. But since then, they've improved the start. You just got to make sure you have elbow space and you're getting out there and you get comfortable, get into a rhythm, you're fast but not too fast. I estimate the first uh, 10 miles will be around uh, 47 to 48 minutes today. And that's fairly close to the American record on a flat course to show you the downhill effects in the wind. That is correct, but you've got to use the downhill a little bit to be able to be efficient. Now the temperature is 58 degrees, it's sunny and clear, the humidity 58, and who's in our lead, Larry? Well, you've got the favorites up there, number one on the left wearing black, and um, it probably has his, uh, his affiliation up there, is uh, Ibrahim Hussein. The colors of uh, Ethiopia are red and green, and we'll look to see if we find the three Ethiopian runners here, two of which are given a chance to run up in that lead pack led by Abebe Mekonen. There you see the human convoy as it kind of spills out of the starting line of Hopkinton, bud. It looks like the retreat from Saigon. I well, did that, but Ginza. earlier than 1975. <laughs> or the Ginza in Tokyo at rush hour. But I think it's important for the, the followers of, of our broadcast today that aren't really used to marathoning to realize that really the, the leaders of the first uh, 10 miles really are not that important. The year that I ran in 1981, since I was pretty inexperienced in the race, I wanted just to hang behind the lead pack, hang behind the top 10 or 15, at least until we got to the halfway point. And at that point in time, make a decision on how I wanted to run the rest of the race. So, a Tanzanian. That's Simon Sa Robert up there, who's a 215 marathoner at altitude, as he's just pulled off to the side and, and uh, kind of doing his own thing. And for what purposes, I'm not sure. A good marathoner, 215 at altitude causes respect. He could be a top 10 finisher. Well, he's uh, from Tanzania, and he trains with uh, uh, Juma Akanga, one of our favorites for the race. And anybody that trains with that guy has got to be in shape. You mentioned a conga, Craig. He's back there in white, just to the right of that lead pack of runners. You'll see his arm carriage. His hand comes up almost to his face. 
on his arm swing. Off to the left, Ibrahim Hussein. The Kenyans, even on the track at a mile and two mile distances, love to lead the races. They love the feeling of control. Well, I think the Africans also are not intimidated by being in the lead. They have shown in many distance races internationally in the last 10 years that they're not scared of the lead. They aren't intimidated. They're willing to put it all on the line and suffer later. The first mile we just passed out there unofficially in four minutes, 37 seconds. That's a good control pace. I'm impressed with that pace so far. Uh, it is not 430, 432, which I think causes problems later in the race. I think it's interesting to point out that Hussein, uh, last year's champion, is up in the front also. He's in the black and gold Adidas outfit there, and he looks to be controlled. And at the front, our first and second finishers from last year are at the front of the following pack. And obviously, they're not going to hold anything back today. No exactly. surprise at all. Numbers one and two, Hussein and Ikanga. Based on their finish of last year, those are the numbers they're wearing, and those apparently are the guys to watch. But there's a long way to go, almost 25 miles. Boy, there are, and everybody in the race but is trained ye uh, years for this. You had to qualify to run the Boston Marathon, all 6,500 that we've mentioned, men and women, by running a marathon within the last year and a quarter for different categories. If you're 40 years of age and under, it's three hours. If you're over that, there are categories three hours and 20 minutes, 3.30, 3.40, based on your age group. So as we look at Simon Robert, who is way out in front, but what's he doing, Larry? Well, I don't know what he's doing. I'll tell you this, though. I am impressed that this pace is very controlled right now. 4.37 for the first downhill miles, very comfortable. And he just decided that that was too slow for him for whatever reason. The Kenyans, Tanzanians, Ethiopians, and there you see Juma Ikanga in white off to his shoulder, as they were doing last year over the last half of the course, Ibrahim Hussein. The lead pack is small for a pace that I would say is relatively comfortable. Well, if there's anybody who knows anything about this race at all, he's seated. To my right, he won it four times. Billy Rogers, welcome. Now, you, what's that guy doing out there? Okay, uh, he's a rabbit in the race, I guess, and his job is to set the pace up, make sure they go through a fast first half. You, you mean he has no intent of winning? Uh, I don't think he's going to win, no. I've seen him race moves good. Not that there's usually any problem with that at the Boston Marathon, but uh, he's kind of setting, setting it up, and I think... Um, now, you mean setting it up for Ikaga in case the pace is slow? Uh, setting it for anybody. His countrymen. Yeah, I think he, he is uh, specifically the here. Yeah, to run. No, not just for his countrymen, I don't think. I don't think this is a team thing. I think it's a th it's something to, you know, maybe go for a course record or something. I don't know if the conditions are going to be quite right, but maybe they are. they got tailwind. Billy, I love having you sit here, but I'd rather watch you run. Why aren't you running? <laughs> That's what a lot of people are asking me. I am... Um, I ran the Los Angeles Marathon in March, and my only goal in marathoning now, you know, being a Masters runner over 40, is to try to break. You're over 40? Yes. So I ran last year at 40 and missed it, and I haven't been able to get it. So I tried LA, it was hot, and I didn't feel I recovered well enough. And to run this race, to run a marathon, it's a 100% physical and psychological effort. And if you're not really ready, you know, you'll, you'll just, you'll do terribly. You might drop out, and that's even be more injured depressing. Too. Yeah, and get injured worse. All I right. Do that. I, I think it's a glorious day in Boston. I'm not it's a nice. marathoner. It's it, nice. What is this like it's for the marathon? Is this a good marathon day? I think it's a good day because humidity is low, and that's a killer. Last year here was in the 90% range. I got very dehydrated here last year. That's one of the most important things in road racing, what the level of humidity is. You can't see today. it too well. You want it dry. Crisper it is, the better. It's like it raises your energy level by that much more. You don't have to take in that much water during the race. But it's still a mistake not to take water. So as we watch these guys flying around here at 445 miles or whatever they're doing, if they don't take water, no matter how good they are, they still could run into trouble. Isn't it amazing that in the old days, and that's not so far back, no, it's not. people didn't <laughs> drink water. They thought no. that was sissy stuff. No, we've come a long way, you know, in sports in general. and. You know, physiologists and researchers have studied the best uh, way to get the best out of human performance. And uh, But sometimes you don't think. You know, I mean, look at these guys. They're just looking dead ahead, and they're so caught up. And, and it's kind of a dangerous course because Boston is downhill at the beginning. Now, I have to put you on the spot. Your pick for the men and the women. Uh, that's very tricky. I would like John Facey to win. He's a friend. And uh, he may win. He's Sentimental very good. pick is Tracy, then. 
Uh, yeah, and he it, w it would not surprise me if he does win. No, not at all. Because I, I am like everyone else. I think there's uh, about five or six really deadly runners here, and uh, the Ethiopians. It's a tradition there in the way football is in the United States. It, and they're like the Finns, you know, track and field, the, particularly the marathon. You have to remember that Abiyu Bakila, you know, who won the Olympic gold twice, 60 and 64. So poor, he did not even have running shoes. You know, and here, what a tradition to follow. And But yet he couldn't succeed at Boston. So now he's got to try to succeed here. Mekinen, I'm talking of. Right, Mekinen. Larry Ross. He's my pick. pick, too. Yeah, Larry's right on the money, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kunamitsu Ito running his last marathon. Uh, this is going back live to Japan. And uh, he's chasing Takeyomi, Takeyama Nakaya, Takeyuki Nakayama, uh, who is considered the best of the Japanese runners and finished fourth in the games. I think he'll run very well today here. Three times he's been ranked among the top ten in the world, bud. And there you get an idea of the, how the pace has broken up a little bit here, some of the leaders, into little clusters. Bill, your thoughts on the pace early on? Uh, well, it's two mile here. We've got 920 about. So that's 440 pace. That's a 29 flat 10K. I mean, this is the world record right. they're going for. Everyone's here. The field's been brought together by John Hancock with the intention, and I think it's clear now that this is the world's best marathon. Therefore, you have the, a lot of the world's best runners. It's all a matter, though, that fine line, what can the mind and body take? You know, if the temperature goes right. up another degree or two. You know, that's what I wanted to ask tricky. you. Beautiful day, but is it going to be too warm? I don't know. That's the weatherman you got to talk to. If it goes over 65, you know, then it's going to start hurting people a little bit. You know, but now everyone's flying. They, they seem to be. Uh, I think they're really moving along quick. Well, Bill, when you were out there, your very first marathon. What is the feeling like? Is it new territory? Is it <laughs> like being an explorer? <laughs> Well, Boston, it's like, uh, it's very overwhelming because the road is kind of narrow at the start and it's downhill. It's like, what am I getting into? You better be quick off that line. You, you'll just be trampled. And uh, there's always, usually there are some people that um, don't belong in the front. Nowadays, uh, with a pack like there is here, I mean, that is what you call an Olympic pack. Uh, there are no uh, collegians messing around with these guys. No guys have made a bed at the bar, you know. These guys are <laughs> dead serious. I mean, this is life and death to these guys. I'm really serious about that. This is very important. It's like national honor is at stake, you know. Do you feel they feel that way more than Americans do? Um, no, I don't think so. But I think, uh, I don't think so. But I think many of them, you know, like in Ethiopia, there probably aren't so many sports. There's maybe distance running and maybe soccer or a couple others, you know. But they have a great tradition there. Our tradition is, is, is there too with people like Frank Shorter, John Benoit, but, it, but it's kind of diffused. We have so many sports in this country. In third world countries, but also, these athletes are allowed to keep their winnings, keep their cars and everything, and that's a great deal of money that can buy farmland or anything else in a country like Ethiopia. I want to find in some ways they might have an edge, but I think if you put all the factors together, I don't think there's a marathon in the world that can stand next to Boston. Well, the course and has I've run so a lot of them. And you've won both <laughs> Boston and New York, so you can straddle that nicely. The marathon goes on, and we shall go on with it. So, there they are. Tanzania. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna correct ourselves. This is three miles. That man's name, and we'll get it on the visuals, is Simon, S-I-M-O-N, Robert. Robert is his last name. I don't know what his middle name is, but he's number one. That's the important thing, isn't it, Craig Virgin? Well, I think his PR is 211.38, and that's the thing that speaks the most to me, bud, the fact that he has run that fast a time. I'm looking at some results. 1988, Beijing Marathon, he was 15th. In 1988, he was also 10th at the Arusha Marathon in Tanzania. These guys like to run fast. Hometown. They're not scared yeah. of it. Uh, I think it's, I'm still virtually surprised that our lead pack behind him is still only about four or five guys. I really thought there would be 15 or 16 men until at least the halfway point today. Hmm. What about you, Didn't Larry? see uh, John Tracy up there, which surprised me. I haven't seen Nakayama up there either. And Nakayama, uh, the lead, uh, led by Mekinen, is only five feet two. They're very short, powerful little human hydroplanes skimming over the ground. Uh, they're five seven, five two, five four. Uh, there you see Juma E. Conger at five feet four in white in background. 
Nakayama would stand out at five, almost 5'11", and I don't know where he is. He should have been right up there with that lead pack. This is not too fast a pace. Three miles have been covered in 13 minutes and 42 seconds. I mean, they're still flying along at 440 pace plus, and I'm amazed at, at uh, that first time for Robert out there. The second pack is running a little bit slower. The group you see right there is trailing Simon Robert by approximately 100 meters. So they're not running as fast, and I think that's wise at this point in the race, Craig. Well, I think I see another gentleman up in that lead pack that we haven't talked about, and that's uh, an Ethiopian by way of Decatur, Georgia, Araga Abraha, who has run very well there recently, has had some up and down races, but he historically has run pretty well in this race. Now, he's lived in Decatur, Georgia for the last uh, five or six years, I think, there, uh, which is a suburb of Atlanta, and he's wearing the green and red colors of Ethiopia, even though he lives in this country. Well, his best time is 2.16 coming in, so it remains to be seen, you know, if All you right. can stay up with him. Let's slip back. Oh, my word, where did all these guys come from? This is Ashland. Now, the race goes Hopkinton, Ashland, Framingham, Natick, Wellesley, Newton Lower Falls, Newton itself, Brookline, and then the goal, Boston. Bob, most, uh, but most of these athletes are asking themselves, really, just kind of monitoring themselves. How do I feel? Am I in, in a comfortable type of pace? They also started the race at about the time and place in the pack that they thought they would finish, so that you don't have 2,000 people pass you if you're much too close to the starting line where the best athletes are. And there's also signs up there to let you know where to slide in during the race, so that you, sh you frequently will form alliances with people around you and keep up a conversation and share kind of a communion of spirit along with the spectators and help you get to that finish line as best as possible. Gentlemen, can somebody come out of this mob to win? No. No. So have we established who the guys who can win are? I think it will be within 10 people or so uh, that have the best shot. I think people can be surprised with something that the experts never would have chosen, some individual, male or female in the respective races, to finish in the top 10 and have a major breakthrough of five or seven minutes maybe. But you can't expect anybody who is, has trained uh, kind of the same as they've ever done, I think, to go from 225 down to 210. No, Larry, the, also the four mile mark was, I believe, 1839 for the lead pack. I don't know whether that was for Robert or not, but the lead pack was around 1839. Still a good pace, but I think somebody can still come up from the behind in terms of the top 10. I don't yes. think they can come from 50th place up, bud, and be able to, to uh, catch the leaders at this point in time. Uh, this fabulous four could contain a winner, but they are behind Simon Robert, who's well out there. He's been accused of being a rabbit by Bill Rogers. Is he? I don't know. You know, Chicago has employed rabbits in the past. If we want to talk about rabbits for a second, I think it's important when we look at all the world records. Do they multiply the in these races, or do you have one <laughs> no, rabbit? they don't multiply. Oh, okay. You generally have one rabbit, unless in some of the faster track races, uh, they actually have two, and they're staggered. One takes the first half of the race, one takes the second half. In this case, I don't believe there's another rabbit beside him, and I'm not even sure that he is actually truly a rabbit. Uh, in the track races, they'll have, say, for instance, in the 1,500 meters, which is almost four laps, They'll have a rabbit take the pace through three laps at world record pace, and then the guys are on their own. And the IAAF, the world governing body, has more or less winked at that in the last few years. At first, it really is technically illegal, but they've winked at it, and I don't think it really uh, has a bearing because the guys are running fast anyhow, and they had to run the entire time. In a marathon like this, he's actually too far in front to be an effective rabbit. What do you think, Larry? I do, and I don't think he'll be around at the finish line like this. Generally, in the Boston Marathon, the person that goes, goes out hardest and sets a withering pace is not the winner. And it's been a pretty easy check through history to find that it's a rare occasion when someone sets early checkpoint records and is around to tell about it in the winner's circle at the Laurel Reef at the finish. Craig Virgin, you as a world-class runner, did you like to have a rabbit out there? Well, I am... <laughs> Like it or not, I used to like to lead the races. I guess I never needed a rabbit because I could set such a, a good pace myself that really most of the time I didn't need it except for maybe on the track in some of the longer races I appreciated being able to have a breather in the middle of the race. I'm looking at uh, Robert's form, his arms and everything. He's certainly running very efficient. I think that's the key thing to remember when you're running the first 10 to 12 miles of Boston because it is downhill, you have a tendency to go faster. But look, his arms are at his waist or lower. He seems to be loose. The shoulders don't seem to be tight. Uh, he seems to have a good, uh, smooth foot plant. Everything seems to be rolling along. He's not spending too much energy at this point in time, I think, or 
rationally. So I don't know. He could roll on, but then again, he's got some very experienced guys on his tail that I wouldn't want back there. That's the intriguing part of the marathon. I don't mind sticking my neck out and say that they'll catch him. I mean, it'll be a matter of time, but they will, they'll reel him in without a problem. It may take until a Newton Hills because he's a 211 marathoner. You run 215, folks, at altitude, and up at 6,000 feet where, where Arusha is located, it's up in the Rift Valley of Kenya, and you're running very, very well at thinner air. The air at that level has 20% less oxygen that your body's trying to cope with, so it slows you down anytime you run more than a half mile. Milers, two milers, all those races are slower at altitude than they are at sea level. So your body gets used to that less oxygen, and it's a form of very legal blood doping to drop from altitude where he lives to down to sea level because your body all of a sudden is oxygenated with more air and better quality air than you're used to breathing. And it helps. Look at the small pack there. I am amazed at that. Wow, and nobody else in sight. This is a, a really, a, this is a big surprise here. Mekanen up there. In white to identify them for you is Juma Ikanga. Wearing the black outfit with number one on his shirt, last year's winner, Ibrahim Hussein. And Arega Abraha is in back. He is an Ethiopian by birth who has lived in this country for the last seven years, as Craig was mentioning, in Decatur, Georgia. And has been a good runner here, but he hasn't run the quality times of the other Ethiopians who are here. Well, I can say I just ran a race against him two weeks ago in Atlanta called the Hard Trek 10K, which is one of the second largest 10K in, in Atlanta other than the Peachtree Road Race. And he owns the course record in that hilly course of below 29 minutes, and he ran very well. But he, he did not run well enough that I would lead, that I would be led to predict that he would be a winner today. I think uh, he's actually most famous because a few years ago, he was leading the race wearing a Sony Walkman uh, in, this, in this very race yes. in the Boston Marathon just a few years ago. I, rem I remember seeing him and saying, I can't believe he did that. I was commenting. What was he race. listening to? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ask him at the time. Uh, well, it certainly wasn't the polka, that's for sure. We can imagine that with the, with the race that they're running today. Obviously, he's taking the race a lot more seriously. DC run or something like that? Was he? Was, I don't know. But since you're a Bostonian, I wanted to ask you, in New York, in, the, in that marathon, they have a blue line that the runners follow the whole way. Why has not Boston ever painted a line from the start to the finish? Oh, we can't afford the paint. Larry, what's the answer to that? That this state does not have a miracle. Is that correct? There is no Duke miracle here, according to the papers. <laughs> you can't afford the paint. No, uh, they asked Governor Dukakis, and he said, no paint this year. And but he knows the course, too. We're trying to paint a picture here of a marathon, and only one man way out there. But can he hold up? And he is an experienced runner. We shall return to the pavement in just a moment. Great kill that might occur. Right now, they're sailing along towards Boston, being pushed by a gentle tailwind, and not too much humidity. They, were, they hit six miles just past 29 minutes. It was on the screen just a second ago. Uh, they're spread out. Again, I agree with you. If it was windy, we'd see them employ a technique called drafting, where they get behind each other, much like the race cars, and let the leader... Bicycle run. racers, too. Exactly. But when they're spread across, they look like a chorus line, and they've gone almost a quarter of the distance. Well, I think some wind is actually good, because it will help dissipate some of that heat. The perspiration on their body can evaporate cleaner, I know that I'm as more concerned about a wind as I am about the temperature. Certainly today, the conditions might be a little bit on the warm side, but I think warmth, uh, heat and humidity actually favors the African athletes. They are used to training at fairly warm levels. While we're at it, let's comment. Ethiopia lies close to the equator. So does in Tanzania and Kenya. All of them live at altitude and train there. The countries are basically anywhere from 3,000 feet. And in the case of Mekinen on the left of your screen, number four, he was born and raised at 9,000 feet in very thin air. The point is that the, the temperature is warm year-round at the equator. At 5,000 feet, it's still very dry, and they have a very temperate climate year-round to train in. And they're used to 60 and 70 degree temperature, so this is right up their alley. That East African plateau, what wonderful country that is. What a wonderful place to live. My perception, bud, is that Hussein is keen off of the Conga, and that Mekinen is keen off of Hussein. And that's what I'm looking. They keep looking at each other and the way they're running relative to their respective positions. I think those three guys are checking each other out, and they're not going to panic. And Araga Ar Abraha actually moves in and out there. He sort of, he may be even disrupting their concentration because I don't think they know who he is. <laughs> the Ethiopians do because he was visiting with them last night, Craig. I happened to catch him chatting with them in the lobby. Uh, but he... Uh, 
he is, has strong political connections, not, not connections, strong political feelings about the war going over there between Eritrea and Tigray provinces as they try either to fight communism or sec seceding from, from Ethiopia is what the battles in those provinces are about. And that's one reason why he left the country. And he's been working to try and, and uh, get rid of the Marxist government over there. Yes, well, Abraha likes hills. Uh, he won his, his biggest victory, I think, last year was when he won the Maggie Valley Moonlight Run, which is a five-mile race where you go down two and a half miles, turn around and come two and a half miles back up. Uh, that's probably his biggest victory last year. So we'll see how the leaders go. We've got a long, long race to go, but they seem to be on a decent pace. Five feet, four and a half. You just saw him right there on your screen. The Tanzanian Army Captain, Juma Ikanga. Articulate, focused, stable, a very disciplined athlete who goes back and trains very hard, picks his races carefully, and rarely ever blows up, as the runners say. Almost every marathon he's ever run in the last four years has been under two hours and 11 minutes. Very consistent five-minute mile pace or faster. He's there you had see some heartbreaking same. losses, hasn't he? Well, he, you're right, Buck, and, and that's a very good point. The man lacks sprinting speed. He has an inability to be able to lift quickly. I know what that's like as a form of miler. I was running in invitational races around the country, and I might be right up with the leaders, but I did not have the ability to sprint hard over the last quarter mile. That's why he lost last year. Uh, a man who has great speed, Hussein, can sit on a guy like... Uh, the man in white there, Juma Ikanga, and just go by him at the end, and the difference can mean $30,000 over the last 100 meters. Well, so, it's an African Derby right now, and a quintet out there doing their best, eyeing each other, as Craig Version has said, perhaps trying to psych each other. We'll get back to that, but we're going to return to the pavement. We do want to say that Ingrid Christensen is leading the women, and Joan Benoit Samuelson is in second place. And that's the race we expected. The pavement is warm, the pack is out on it, and we'll return to them in a moment. Africa, there they are. The runner-up last year from Tanzania, Juma Ikanga, out in front. Robert Simon, or Simon Robert, take your pick. He says he doesn't care. Mekinen, the Ethiopian, last year's champion, Ibrahim Hussein. And Arega Abraha, he's a little bit of a surprise as we go back into the race and back to tape earlier to look at Joni Benoit Samuelson. Well, we're not going to show you Joni, but don't worry, there'll be plenty of her on this telecast. And here they are, the lead women, as we go to Barbara Bickford. Barbara, what can you tell us here? I see Ingrid Christensen, who could miss her with that short blonde hair, and proper Bostonians will love her because she's running in white gloves. Well, I don't think that Ingrid's trying to make a fashion statement today, Bud, but she did indicate that she was trying to go out at 218 pace in order to guarantee the first sub-220 women's marathon. Uh, she looks comfortable. She's shaking out her arms right now. And um, one of the things that happens with the lead women in a race is that they get this group of men that latch on to them early in the race, assuming that the lead woman's going to run 220. So they hook on to her, figuring that that's going to bring them to a PR, which usually happens to these men, is that they all fall off as the woman goes ahead. Now, I've heard this term a couple of times, PR. What's that mean? Pretty running? Or what, what is PR? <laughs> no, PR is definitely not pretty running. If they get a PR, they usually look pretty bad at the end because that's a personal record. A personal record. All right. The woman you're looking at, Barbara Bickford, a graduate of Wisconsin Parkside, a distance runner there. She has run marathons. She's the assistant athletic director at Brandeis University in Waltham. Who are you picking to win this race? Well, I'm going to use Craig's cop-out technique, and I'm going to pick three favorites. Pick ten. I mean, if we're going to cop out that way. <laughs> okay. I think that the technical favorite ha has to be Ingrid Christensen. Um, Ingrid has um, done an incredible progression up to this race. Um, she's raced well. She's raced fast. She's the chalk. She should win it, right? Is that correct? I would say that she has to be the favorite. The only iffy part about whether Ingrid will win or not is because she is traveling into that unknown territory. No one has run as fast as she's attempting to run. And um, when you take a risk, you also risk blowing up. My sentimental favorite is Joan Samuelson. 
Um, Joni has done more for women's running in the United States than any other athlete. And Joni is um, in good condition. She's had a lot of problems in the last um, few months, knees, hips, back. But uh, sh she's very, very focused, and no one has a bigger heart or a tougher head than Joni. Uh, my, my third, there's there a picture is. of Joan right now on the screen. Uh, Joan looks very comfortable. She's maybe not as smooth as Ingrid, but she still looks okay right now. My, my surprise or potential surprise is actually a group of women, the entire wi American women's contingent. Lisa Weidenbach, Kim Jones, and Kathy O'Brien all have the potential today to run a good, steady breakthrough race and climb up to the next level. Two days ago, you said, Barbara, I think we've lost Joni. I don't think, I think she's going to drop out. Now, what's happened in those two days? Well, I didn't really say that I thought she was going to drop out. What I said was that I think that Joni goes into every race with the intent to win. And if she has technical problems, um, you know, something mechanically wrong with her, then I don't think she'll crawl to the finish line. Um, there's no reason for her to prove that she can finish a race. Um, she will give it her best shot. Otherwise, um, if she has a technical problem, I expect her to drop out. Which is very great. She won her first race, and he said, the exhilaration I saw in her, I will never forget. As we look at Ingrid Christensen powering along there. And she, of course, went on from competition as a skier uh, to compete as a runner at Bowdoin College and eventually evolved after a good high school career for two years as a miler to becoming a marathoner. Ingrid Christensen right now has 35 seconds on Joan Benoit as the runners in the lead pack that you're seeing right there with Ingrid have passed the seven-mile mark. Strung out behind Joan Benoit Samuelson in second place is Lisa Weidenbach, Priscilla Welsh, and we don't know right yet where Kathy O'Brien is. But I think the shape is beginning to take place of the women's race. Joni is trying to stay close to Ingrid to see if she might run into problems by going out too hard. That's not too big a, a lead to give up, only five seconds per mile for the first almost quarter of the race, actually more than a quarter. Joan indicated in the pre-race press conference that she was going to run her own race. Um, she's well aware that Ingrid's planning to go out at a new world record and a sub-220 pace. Um, Joan, I think, she's not thinking slow but steady wins the race, but I think that Joan is intending to run within herself, and she's very conscious of where Ingrid is. And Joan's also going to have the support of the crowds along the way, and that's going to mean a lot in the latter stages of this race. The she woman certainly you, will. But the woman we're looking at right there has a faster marathon time than any of the men in the countries of Panama, Costa Rica, Uruguay, and there's about 30 other countries that belong to the IAAF where she has a faster marathon time than any man has ever run. She is the world record holder on the track for women at 5,000 meters, the world record holder at 10,000 meters, recently at New Bedford went the half marathon and a world best time on the roads ever. There's never been a woman like her, Barbara, and, and it's a tremendous task to face when you've been injured to come back as Joan Benoit has and anybody else and face the likes of this young lady. Well, as we look at the female alphabet, is it I before J, Ingrid before Joni, or J before I? Barbara Bickford, talk to both these women just a couple of days ago. Here they are on the road. Well, there's no doubt that Joan and Ingrid are going to be battling out for uh, the lead in this race. What I'm really wondering is if they're going to be able to pull those other Americans and the other women up to the next level of a marathoning. Well, the one, two, threes have all won Boston, including Weidenbach. And the lead men are moving into Natick, and we'll get into Natick ourselves in just a moment. Nine miles run of 26 plus 385 yards. It's an African carnival. Mekinen out in the lead, but they're very, very close. Arega Abraha has dropped off the pace, Larry. Yes, he has, and, and I'm not surprised, I guess, in a way. Craig was commenting how his 10,000 meter time wasn't up. It, it is now a group of four athletes World-class all, Ikonga, ranked number five in the world, the man on the left, the man in the middle, number four, was ranked number four by Track and Field News in 1988 at the marathon distance. Ibrahim Hussein, ranked number nine. Simon Robert, considered maybe a bit of an outsider here, at two hours and 11 minutes for best marathon, this guy can hold on. Right now, and Craig, talk about this, 
the athletes tend to monitor each other. They listen for, listen for breathing. Bill Rogers was an expert at this. They watch the Heavy breathing? Motions. They're listening for that? Heavy breathing, and they're Ooh. all guys, too. Well, there's there's heavy breathing and there's normal heavy breathing, Larry. And I I'd like to that. hear these gradations <laughs> of heavy breathing, Craig Virgin. But we're great in hotels, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, actually, I'm looking. I you know I, I I listen for foot strike. You know, somebody starts to run flatter on their feet, start to pound can you, the pavement. Oh, can, I can you hear that? It. Okay. It doesn't even really matter what kind of shoe brand it is either. I can <laughs> tell when they hit. I knew you wouldn't on waffle on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I, you know, I think the main thing is looking at breathing, looking at arms, looking at their shoulders, their necks, their jaws. It's important to watch their jaws. If it's tight, they're generally forcing themselves. This is much too soon in the race for any of these guys to be tied. If anybody is tight at all, they're not going to win. One of the Here names we talked about was Nakayama, the Japanese. And how does he look to you, Craig? This is back... Well, uh, his stride, he's not lifting his knees at all. He doesn't seem to have any good lift to his arms. I think I don't even think he's going to finish the race if he looks that bad right. this early. Okay, let me add something here. Nakayama had a right ankle problem. It has troubled him in training at different times over the last nine months. And if you watch him, he is kind of prancing gingerly in his foot. He's, he's behind the man on the left. It's difficult to see. But if he's this far back, I mean, this man is in real trouble. Uh, and there goes the, the fortunes, to some extent, of a victory for the Japanese. Look at him. He's, look at how much. Now, look at him pull over to the road here. Is he leaving the course? Is a question mark here. No, picking up maybe some refreshment. But the young man who uh, is the heir apparent, many people feel, to Japan's great star for the last 10 years, Toshihiko Seiko, who won twice here in Boston, is not in good shape. I mean, look at that motion. Craig. Well, I'll tell you, I think if I was in Nakayama's shoes right now, I would probably pull out of the race because uh, he's not going to do himself any good to run a full 26 miles at this form. I think he's probably doing oh. He's probably going to jog to the next checkpoint and grab a ride home. Now, this is going to be somewhat disappointing for the Japanese people back home, even though he is controversial, because he certainly was one of their biggest hopes. And you know, the, the, the Japanese have loved the Boston Marathon ever since Will Cloney invited the Japanese back to Boston after World War II and made sure that they were very welcome. And I think the Japanese regard this Boston Marathon on a level right with their favorite home country race, which is the right. Fukuoka Marathon. Well, Seiko won two years ago here, and I'm glad you mentioned Will Cloney, the longtime director of the race for the Boston Athletic Association. Because he took a lot of criticism, really, when the race was transformed from purely amateur uh, racing with only a prize of a bowl of beef stew. Did you ever have that bowl of beef stew? I ended up on ever run. We tend to call it world records, or everybody does. It's really a world best, even though we may say world record, because every course in marathoning is different. Mm -hmm. This course is relatively easy. It starts at 490 feet, and right now they're at 150 feet of elevation past the 10 mile mark in this course. So they've fallen downhill and now it will ripple up and ripple down until we reach about 15 feet above sea level at the finish. So the courses all vary, but I think that what makes Boston a course great is the difficulty of negotiating, for, I call it the four Newton hills because there four, are four in Newton and they come at a strategic point in the race. Ingrid keeps running to the left of Kim Jones, a Colorado. Is that an advantage to her in any way to stay with him? Some people like, uh, such as, uh, Joni and Ingrid and Greta, the top runners, like other men around them. Uh, others don't like it, and sometimes they crowd too closely, and they're on there to get also the applause, and they know they're going to be on television and be seen, and it can be an, a hindrance as much as a help. Uh, if they give you your space, it's probably okay to have a phalanx of people surround you and, and support you. Barbara Bickford. Ingrid just went through the 10 mile mark in 52.52, which tell you? tells me that she's running smoothly, which the, our screen also showed, but that she is not at a sub 220 pace if she's feeling the wind or the weather, if she's made a conscious decision to slow down on those bases because she wants to win the race. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on in her mind right now. She looks comfortable and fit, and she's running very fast. Is this better for Joan Benoit Sanderson? Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily better for Joan or not. I think it might have been better if Ingrid had continued her blistering pace with the option of blowing up at the end. Ah. Um, you know, what happens after that 20 mile mark. Um, the fact that Ingrid's slowing her pace down may allow her to finish 
um, you know, more smoothly and consistently and not blow up at the end. The difference between her ninth mile, which was 519, and her tenth mile, which we saw was just 542, means that Ingrid has slowed significantly. Um, that could indicate that she's experiencing some sort of problem. If I could add a, a point here, I just, uh, the mile from mile 9 to mile 10 slows down because the elevation actually goes up by 25 feet as opposed to a downward bias there. So the rippling effect is changing some of the, the strategies here and to some extent the pace that we're seeing out there. You can see here just kind of trucking along with the rest of the guys and doing the math, she is right about the 220 mark that we talked about here and, and of course she still has the Newton Hills to contend with. She has a history, and I'm referring to Ingrid Christensen on your screen, of slowing down slightly in the second half of races and depending on how fast she's gone out, it's very difficult to maintain this pace the entire way. And the difference in uh, Boston for the elite athletes seems to be about a two minute or so differential second half versus first half. She would have had to have been at about a 218 pace now to guarantee a 220 effort at the finish. If she's at 220 pace now, she's probably looking at a 222, maybe even 223 um, final time. Why the white gloves? Is this to appeal to the Brahmin ladies of Boston who go to the symphony on Fridays? <laughs> no, those white gloves, Ingrid um, wears contact lenses, and she wears those white cotton gloves to keep the sweat out of her eyes. Well, very demure, very nice. This young lady had a great career in track and field, and Ingrid Christensen, we're talking about in the middle of that pack, at age 15 in 1971, she was an international star for Norway, and of course has had a history of competing head-to-head -head with Greta Weitz for years. She actually left the sport for several years and became a world-caliber cross-country skier, representing Norway in international competitions and being ranked among the best in the world. She then got back in the sport in 1978. She should like this downhill course, then. She should. But she probably does well on uphills, too, because <laughs> they know how to shush along. Everything. Well, those guys, Kim Jones is one of them, and it's very nice to run with the leading lady. You get your face on television a lot. Well, they know that, and that's one reason why you always see a group of people congeal around the lead woman or the second pack of, of, uh, of men also have uh, other people hanging around them. So, Joni Benoit, still hopes? Still hopes. This seemed too dominant. Yes, and Lisa's a very interesting case. Um, Lisa has always said that she hopes she doesn't go down um, in history as a trivia answer. What would be the question? Who finished fourth at both the 84 and 88 Women's Olympic uh -huh. Trials? Uh -huh. uh, I feel like I'm playing Missing Jeopardy here. Who was? Yeah. Um, Lisa finished fourth in both those races. Um, she was obviously disappointed. She regrouped. She came back at Chicago, um, broke that 230 barrier for the first time in winning the race. Um, she has m maintained that momentum and focused on Boston and was um, very intent on improving on that sub-230 performance. Uh, she also said that she wanted to be in position to pick up the pieces should Ingrid falter in her world record How attempt. far behind Christensen is she? Uh, the last report we've had was two minutes behind with Joan Samuelson being about um, four or five seconds behind that, although we can't see Joan in the screen, so she may have dropped off further than that. Two minutes, is that insurmountable? It's not insurmountable because you never know what's going to happen after that 20 mile mark. Two words that don't exist in the, in the lexicon of the marathon, never and always. <laughs> Now, we started the show with the wheelchair start, and they move much quicker than the runners, and we're nearing the finish line. This is a surprise. This is not Mustafa Badid, and I'm not sure who that is, as he turns and heads down the 600 yards uh, of, the, of Boylston Street. So this is the first finish of the day, we'll see. And... We're going to have a name for you. We don't have it yet. Really pumping iron there with these digital chariots. This is Philippe Coupri, who is a teammate and from France, as um, Mustafa Badid is, and has trained with him and finished, was a medalist at the 1988 Olympic Games that they had in wheelchair competition. He went one hour, 40 minutes, and 16 seconds in the Seoul Olympics and has really improved a lot in the last couple of years. He was, he was oh, something like, he was a top finisher last year in this race, but I believe he was something like 14 minutes behind Badid's 
world record performance last year of one hour, 43 minutes that he covered the Boston Marathon. As you can hear the crowd beginning to roar in the background, if he breaks the deed's record, he's got another $7,500. Well, he took that last look, and it was a beauty because he saw no one behind him. He knows he's the victor. Bien joué, monsieur. Coupri. 136. I just heard unofficially uh, the announcer, Tom Grook, announced 136. That is a new world record performance in wheelchair competition. The record was broken, Bud, three times last year, starting with the Boston Marathon. It was broken again uh, in the Olympics and followed up in a week to Japan with another 138 performance. I'm not sure this is Bedid. It looks like him. He's got a very... there. Oh, it's Andre Viger, former winner here from Quebec, who was also a medalist. He was the other medalist in Seoul, Korea. It is indeed Viger. Andre Viger was a past winner, 35 years of age. He is a jeweler up in Canada and Quebec. He lives in Sherbrooke. A Look at that body. The race, Larry. They train very, very hard. They work out up in Quebec because of the bad weather on rollers, and they do interval training up there. Just a phenomenal time. Uh, I was talking with Bob Hall, uh, who founded this sport. He was telling me about how much better he thought the athletes now were than when this sport well, was just not, eight or nine years ago. not only the athletes, Larry, but in 1975, when the wheelchair race began, they began with wheelchairs, just like Dr. Gillespie, do you remember him in the Dr. Kildare series and so on? They were cumbersome wheelchairs, and Larry Rawson has looked into it to see what they're riding today. Point Chan has just been plugging along steadily. She looks very strong and very comfortable. We haven't seen her doing any of those things. She won four years ago. Could she conceivably win today? She, yes, she could, in my opinion. It all depends on whether there's faltering up in front with the pace that is being set by, uh, by, uh, Ingrid, and of course her pace has been more reasonable. Look what's going on uh, out in that race course there now. You see Christensen pounding along. It's right now at the unofficial time at the halfway point for Ingrid Christensen. We have 109.30, and she's on a 219 pace. The split for Weidenbach was approximately one hour, 11 minutes, and 21 seconds. So she's a 223, 224 pace. And Joan Benoit Samuelson was just uh, 16 seconds astern of Weidenbach as they approach the halfway point. So they're running 223, 224, absolutely uncharted waters for Weidenbach, and yet she's holding together quite well and keeping, uh, I think, Christensen in, in, uh, in step, so to speak, with her out in front. Newton Lower Falls. Now the hill start. Now, but I wonder if that black Labrador... So here they are, the lead men. Craig Virgin's back with us. Number two, Juma Ikanga. And who's that right behind him? Well, I'll tell you what, he may have dropped the man that beat him last year, Ibrahim Hussain, because Ibrahim has dropped out the back, but he's still got a shadow, and that is Abebe Mekinen. They're both looking back, but I think Mekinen looks the most confident right now. It's, we're in the hills right now, and it's going to get it to be a tough race very soon. Into the hills. Well, as the women at Newton Lower Falls, I promised to tell you about that dog, Larry. 1951, Johnny Kelly, the younger, was leading the race. They came through Newton Lower Falls. A dog ran out and spilled him. He never recovered, did he? I read that in the book in the Boston Marathon. I started to laugh because I knew that dog is dead. The dog is dead, <laughs> but the memory <laughs> lingers on. I know. Ingrid Christensen. So far the winner for the women, but there is a way to go. Two Americans in second and third positions. Lisa Weidenbach, Joan Benoit Samuelson. Joan twice the winner, Lisa once the winner, and Ingrid has won it once before, 1986. There has never been that I can recall a woman over the number of years that she has trained, train as hard as the woman that you're looking at for any running distance. In Ingrid Christensen, I mean, this is a woman who, when she was training for her skiing, did running, did cross-country skiing of up to 25 and 30 miles a day, and then threw in 200 push-ups just for her shoulders as well, per day. Larry, I can also believe that I've done interviews with her before, and she does uh, training on a treadmill. Even when the weather's not that bad outside, she loves the solitude of a treadmill. She has run a sub-32 minute 10K on the treadmill as part of her training regimen. She also had a picture in front of that treadmill, Craig, of Joan Benoit Samuelson winning in 1984 at the Olympic Games as a motivational tool. She must have been li listening to that sports psychologist. Now, 
the men are going to the hills, and you've heard so much about Heartbreak Hill, which was named by Jerry Nason, the late sports editor of the Boston Globe, concerning John Kelly, who's somewhere back there, 81 years of age, he's coming right along, and wasn't it Tarzan Brown? What yes, was that was. race when they named it Heartbreak Hill? Well, Bud, that took place uh, in, the, I believe it was the 1938 race, and what happened was he was leading the race. Tarzan Kelly. Brown had built up, no, Tarzan oh, Brown Tarzan had built up a, a long lead, and Kelly kept nailing him slowly but surely, and on the last of the Newton Hills by Boston College, he caught up with him, patted him on the fan as he started to go by him, woke up Brown, Brown turned and saw him, and took off in the middle of the hill, and put on a real burst, and buried Kelly. And that's why it became known as Heartbreak Hill, as he worked from behind, came up and hit him. What an incredible performer Tarzan Brown was, and there against an Indian, the year he won, that year, he had to borrow his entry fee of one dollar at the starting line, so they'd let him in. Amazing. Kelly uh, was, was uh, I shouldn't say Kelly, Jerry Nation of the Boston Globe was very, very enamored with Tarzan Brown and said in, later in his life when I talked to him that he felt he could run with anybody today given the proper training. He was that gifted. And of course, as an Indian living in Narragansett, Rhode Island, he really wasn't schooled in the normal training methods that we know today. Only two guys in the front is that we are now at mile 18 or we've passed mile 18 and Juma Conga ran a 508 mile and it's 126.58 that equates out to 450 pace or an expected world record of somewhere in the 206 for the marathon that's a very very impressive time but Mekinen is not going to let him have this without a battle Mekinen has just surged to the front right now he may be trying to make his move on the hills like I did against Seiko in 1981 so here they are Ikanga second place last year Mekinen it's Tanzania against Ethiopia. And we'll return to these men. They're not going anywhere except all the way to Boston. Christensen leading the women. And Larry, we haven't had a call yet for John Tracy. Where is he? Interesting. We couldn't find him in the top 10 early on, but it's changed since then. And we have just been given word that he has moved up from sixth to fifth place. And the last word we had at mile 17, that's a mile and a half ago, is that he was 34 seconds behind the lead pack. That's about 175 yards, bud. And, and it's going to be interesting to see if he can, can he let, he laid off the early pace. These guys are slowing down through the Newton Hills. Craig version of the pace. Bud, the guys that drop off at any point in time now, they are probably not going to stay in the top five. They're going to self-destruct because of that fast early pace. I think there's some interesting mind games going on here. As first, Mekinen takes the lead, then Akanga takes the lead. They're looking at the hills. I do not know which one of these is the better hill runner. They both seem to be handling the hills equally well. But I think John Tracy, because he knows this course, because he's trained on this course, he knows how to pace himself properly. Whether he can catch the leaders, I don't know. Now Mekinen steps ahead of Ikanga again. Ikanga went through this last year with Hussein, but where is Hussein? Hussein is 34 seconds back, and he is running right now with John Tracy. Remember I mentioned nobody likes the no man's land? Tracy falls, uh, Tracy's moving up, and Hussein joins him. Mekinen right now, and his, his coach, who is the national coach, Nagusi Roba, and has been for 20 years. They have a stable of 32 distance runners over there uh, in, in Ethiopia. They have had these athletes who are going to be competing in Boston out several times a week on a course that simulates Boston that is outside the capital city of Addis Ababa. And he said he's been training on the hills very similar to Boston. And of course, that's at seven or 8,000 feet. So uh, the benefits there are extraordinary, and he's been trying to prepare for Boston. There's surging tactics definitely being played out here as they take turns pushing the pace on each other to test each other's will. Well, it's the old Alphonse Gaston technique. After you, my dear Ikanga. No, no, after you, my dear Mekinen. Supposedly, they hit the 20th mile with another 508 mile pace. So Ooh. they're handling the miles, and they're not letting the pace slack off that much. Uh, what's interesting right now here, there you go. You see this graphic that we've got up there. Uh, and that was uh, Greg Meyer, and I don't think we'll have another American winner today. The closest example we have to an American winner up there is John Tracy, who has lived in this country for about 13 years. We'll claim it. We are approaching the Heartbreak Hill. This is mile 20 to 21, and if I remember the course correctly here, they are beginning to approach the bottom of Heartbreak Hill. Heartbreak Hill, Craig Virgin, what did that mean to you? But it's not really that tough of a hill. It depends on where you come from and where you train on. It's about 600 yards long. There's a grassy strip in the middle that a lot of the local runners around Boston do intervals on to get their hill training in. But I think that if you pace yourself properly, you can aggressively attack this hill because from there on, from the very top, you know it's downhill all the way. But what kind of a hill is it, really? If you were driving along there, you wouldn't 
find it a remarkable ascent, would you? No, and this, it's not necessarily how steep the hill is, it's where it comes in the race. Between 20 and 21, you're very, very fragile, both psychologically and physically, and just the slightest little margin of error is enough to offset the balance. We're talking, these guys have really got to run the tank dry going in the last six miles, especially if they want that world record. So a hill is only a hill when you're far, far along. Here we come to Heartbreak Hill. Right there it is. Right the you've read about it. You've heard about it. Heartbreak Hill, Commonwealth Avenue. In Newton. I trained on this, bud, and boy, this is a barn. I wondered what happened to you. I did. I tell you, it fried my mind. It really did. But I'd like to say that a conga has to be thinking about last year. Last year's race must be replaying through his mind. He did not lose Hussein last year at this point. He let Hussein hang all the way to the end and then get out sprinted. If I was to make a move, if I had the kind of training that he did, I might want to get away from my competition sooner than the last mile. Mackinac on the right. Ikanga right beside him. Ethiopia, Mackinac, Tanzania, and John Tracy of Ireland, and we're certainly going to claim him for Boston if he does come Tracy, in here. Tracy's running a great race back there. We just had a split second where we could actually see how far behind he is. He is moving up. Hussein is is not running with him anymore, as you can see. He is no more, there you see Hussein in, in, over the right shoulder of He's Tracy in, in the background. He's just over the right shoulder in fourth. Is and he out of it? Simon Roberts back there, yes, I think he is. Hussein, the defending champion, is out of it, you I'm, I'm guessing, but I don't think you'll see him back again up with the lead pack. I Tracy see did. Bill Rogers, wise old, or wise moderately old, Bill Rogers nodding. He thinks Hussein is out of it. I don't think Hussein's even going to finish in the top six. You don't like to lose momentum at this point in the race. If he was within two miles, maybe he could grit his teeth and hang on. But we're talking five miles to go here. That's much too long to be able to gut it out. So is this a repeat of last year with Mekinen taking Hussein's place and Tracy in third again? Notice how few times over the last 15 miles or so you have seen a baby Mekinen in the lead. Right now, Tracy, who you're looking at on the screen, continues to work on both of them. But there you see, there you see Juma. He feels the need to have to lead. He knows that the man behind him has more sprinting speed. The pressure is on him. I went through this in the mile all the time. I had guys who was running with who had, who had somewhat faster times. So I had to take the kick out of it. And that's what he's trying to do in the marathon distance. It's no different than the mile. Larry, I'd like to point out that Mekinen, I guess, is sort of a semi-favorite for me because he finished second in the World Cross Country Championships in 1986. You guys are all going to say you picked him if you want. I saw no. Austin in the Globe today picking he was, Hussein. He shows up at the studio. He says, Mekinen, Mekinen, Mekinen. That's fair. That's Mekinen fair. was the technical <laughs> favorite. I told you that. And then Tracy is my sentimental favorite. You guys favorite. don't count. You guys Tracy's don't count. coming up in third place. I but picked however, Bill Rogers, and he wasn't even. He shows up sitting beside. Oh, that pick's gone down the drain. <laughs> okay, we'll give you that one. You and, and Barbara should run for the Senate. I mean, picking three wins. Well, I was just watching the political <laughs> campaign very, uh, very respectful this past year. Anyhow, Mekinen is still there in, in uh, Akanga's shadow. He's not letting him get away. He seems to be concentrating on his back. That's a perfect technique to use. Sit behind the guy, focus on the small of his back, look at his cadence, just get in there and groove behind him and try to ride that train all the way to downtown Boston. Now, are these two aware at all of John Tracy in third place? I don't think so. The person who might be that I have seen turn around several times is Ikanga in the lead. I have not seen Mekinen turn around. I don't think that they're conversing with each other at all. But you know where they may also be able to start noticing is the applause behind them start to ripple up so that they're hearing it. And you can tell that someone's there. Well, Tracy's about 20-some seconds back, so they'll be able to hear the applause in the background, especially of all the Irish crowd along the route. But however, I don't think that Mekinen has looked back once. You know, I'm wondering just how hot it is now. Uh, Conga Tracy has looks a white just fine, doesn't he? Well, Conga yeah. has a white uniform on, and then, of course, the Ethiopian national colors are green and red. I don't know how much that reflective quality of the white uniform will help in the heat this last four or five miles. I take every advantage with you. Green is an absorbing color, and it absolutely actually absorbs the sun a little bit and makes your body a little hotter. Conga ahead again. It's like a basketball game with the lead changing hands every second. Well, we just received notice that the temperature is 61 degrees, humidity 58%, and as far as I'm concerned, that's still decent conditions, and that may explain why they're on a world record pace today. What are we looking at? What is the world record, gentlemen? Two hours, six minutes, 50 seconds, and let's give a tip of the hat to a country called Ethiopia, which is located in East Africa at elevation. It is a relatively poor country. Uh, 95 percent of the population of 40 million people are farmers. That man 
John Tracy is trying to track down one whose ancestors were. His dad was a farmer. He grew up at 9,000 feet of Baby Mekonen. There you see him up in the lead. Uh, but Ethiopia, this very weekend, had one runner, one of their runners, Belena Denzimo, who, Belania Denzimo, who is the world record holder, win the Rotterdam race. They then sent three of their other top marathoners to the World Cup Marathon in Italy, and they beat the Soviet Union, France, and Italy this same weekend. And here they have a baby Mekonen rated fourth in the world coming to Boston. Imagine spreading that. We can't even place people in the top. They've got marathoner superb. Tremendous well, talent. I think it's important to clarify the world record for men is two hours, six minutes, and 50 seconds by Densimo of, of Ethiopia. And Mekonen certainly, to get the national record, he's going to have to break to the break world record. To break the world record. That's right. To even get the Ethiopian national record. Now, Akanga's national record is his own record of 208 and 10. And both of these guys obviously are on world record pace now. They're, they're going for water now. It's important. I want to see what they do, whether they drink it, whether they throw it over their head. Just how, and they're sharing. They're sh that, uh, that, well, that does happen, though, Craig. Well, well that's you, sportsmanship, isn't it? I was just reading in today's paper about the car racing, and I don't think the auto drivers share uh, any leads at all when it comes to a race. I don't know anybody who does that. That was a very nice vignette, and, of course, one of the scenes that makes the Boston Marathon the wonderful experience it is. And so, of course, we'll return to it. The Boston Marathon, the Norwegian. Ingrid Christensen, still on world record pace. I'm Bud Collins with Larry Rawson and Bill Rogers, who won this thing four times. Gentlemen, both races on world record pace. I think what it is, for the first time in a number of years, you've got good quality racing weather. It's usually been too humid. Now, there's the first official winner, Nina Cusick, 3.10.36, and last year, Rosamota, the Portuguese, 224.30. The improvement between the two when, when Cusick was the first official winner in 1972 is a difference to show the improvement in women's distance running of eight miles in one race. Wow. In, in, a, in a decade, they've come a long way as oh, the top women, right? And well, today, maybe we're going to see history written again. If well, let's, keep not, going. let's not forget Bobby Gibb, the first unofficial runner when women were not allowed in 1966. She ran anyway, and Kathy Switzer the following year. They sure were pioneers. Now, John Tracy in third place, the Irish runner. What's his chance, Bill Rogers? Uh, he's about 30 seconds back. I think, you know, it's, John uh, always does run very strong. You know, I, I have a feeling, though, uh, Mekinen is going to take it, just like we all were Oh, I know. You and Rawson said you pick somebody else and come in here. Mekinen, 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 Mekinen. Mekinen. He doesn't look tired. No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't even show frowns on his face, which a Kango always does, you know. I mean, he's out for a stroll. When you're training at 9,000 feet, you come down to Boston. Some stroll. Sea level. It's like you can take in twice the oxygen, you know? This guy's like the most high-powered sports car in the world, if you want to make an analogy of a car. I mean, his heart and lungs, the engine in this machine, are phenomenal, you know? And the machine weighs less than 120 pounds. You're talking about That's something right. light. Uh, to show you how far the sport also has come, in 1899, a bricklayer from Boston won this marathon. He's actually from Medford, Massachusetts, kind of a suburb, and he weighed 173 pounds. Now, you know, you, you cannot weigh a lot of weight and carry that weight over speed like this. These guys are really feather merchants, as we used to say in the Marine Corps, very light people, and they're, they're hydroplaning over the ground. Five feet, four and a half is the leader, 118 pounds. And Denzimo, uh, not Denzimo, but uh, Baby Mekon in, in second place, weighs under, uh, actually 127 pounds. He's only five, two and a quarter. But if you put both those gentlemen next to someone who doesn't do aerobic exercise, isn't born at altitude, their hearts are twice the size of an uh, average person. John Tracy, how much weight will they lose in a rate, race like this? They don't have much to lose. Well, on a cool day, they'll probably lose a couple of pounds just of water, dehydration. Mm -hmm. Fabulous shot we just saw. 22 miles into the race, we may be able to get a cue as to what their pace is. It's very hard to work your way up. Tracy is considered among the most respected athletes in, in marathoning and distance racing competition in the world. He is tenacious. He's tough. I said that in the opening piece. He's come from way back in the race. He was not among the top 12 at one time, and he's about 125 or so yards behind these two right now with about four miles to go. In the Cleveland Circle? Coming around the hill and heading past Bill Rogers' old store down there, I think, Bill. The, the last mile was running 5'11", I guess, uh, still pretty quick. The only thing that John's missing is either training at altitude or have not being born at altitude. Otherwise, I think he'd be neck and neck right up here. But um, 
still a fantastic race. I just want to say one thing. In ninth place at the 20 mile mark was John Campbell, 40 year old from New Zealand, running around a 211 marathon. Now the world record for a man over 40 is 211.19. That is the oldest record in road racing that I know of. Significant record. The Masters. And so this is a day of records. We're really going to see some fall here in all categories. Ingrid Christensen now, and Heartbreak Hill is certainly unisex. She must mount that hill now. She's done it before. She won the race three years ago. But this has been, as its name describes, a heart cruncher for many athletes who had their sights on winning. With about five and a half miles to go, she is right now about one minute under her world record pace coming through the Newton Hills. Her sure pace has slowed down just a little bit, but she will pick it up when she gets out of these hills. And to show you how good she is, she, her world best time is faster than every men's Olympic champion in the marathon from 1896 right up to 1960. Oh, Lord. What's interesting, though, is the, what's the changes in this race. Uh, Joan Bunner and Samuelson is not in contention. Right now, she's not in the top five. Second place is Weidenbach. What, a couple minutes back, Larry? Yes, Weidenbach is about three minutes three. behind right now, but running the race of her life. She's running and probably going to be maybe the second fastest marathoner in American history on a women's side. Wouldn't this be wonderful if a woman can break 220? I wanted to ask you guys, where's that wall I'm always reading about that somebody's supposed to hit? It'll show up. Just watch the splits of... It's uh, not at Fenway Park, is it? Look at Christensen's no. face. This is the, the, she's struggling through that barrier now, you know, and probably between 22 and 24 miles is where it's toughest in the marathon. However, the good thing about Boston is downhill finish. So she's, and you've got the good weather today. Nobody ran downhill like you, Billy. Well, these guys are. <laughs> you know, you can't, uh, not, it's not on the uh, screen right now, but I'm sure that we're, we're going to get fantastic times by uh, uh, the African man also. Here they are. Ikanga, the leader, he lost by one second last year to Hussein, and Hussein has faded. Behind him, Abeba, Mekanen of Ethiopia. So it's a Tanzania, Ethiopia, East African road race right here. Third place, John Tracy of Ireland. Juma has to become the Pied Piper of this race because of the fact, as we've mentioned, he lacks the speed. It's really a terrible position How's to be How does Tracy in. look to you? I think Tracy's fine. I mean, he's got the sustenance to draw on the fact that he's made up so much ground on these guys. He can see them in his eyesight. He's got the roar of the crowd. He lives in the New England area. You know, you, you do certainly have an Irish contingent that will be giving him a round of applause. The man is a seasoned veteran, having in 1979 won his first World Cross Country Championship, and he's really been a star athlete ever since. 1984 surprise second place finisher, the silver medalist in the Olympic Games at the marathon distance. The thing is, John has never won a marathon. He's only run about five or six. Uh, Mekinen has and uh, Ikenga has, but John goes to the competition is very brutal and uh, the best competition there. That's very tough. So some refreshment for John Tracy. You can see the sun on their shoulders a little bit. Even though it's cool and everything, it still uh, hurts you a little bit, that bright sun. I guess it does. So, Bill Rogers, we're going to go away for just a moment, but when we return, these two guys will probably be in the lead. Ikanga and Mekinen, but look, look at the top of your screen. John Tracy, he's gained during the commercial break. How many people can say that? Hey, but I trained with uh, John Tracy out in Phoenix the last couple of years, and the Boston Marathon is the only thing I think that interests him really in running these days. He's got gold medals from the World Cross Country. He's got silver medal for the Olympic Games, and I think if he could win Boston, I have a feeling he'd retire very happy. So Tan he's he's gunning for these guys, but uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Ireland. One, two, three. Bill, at a point in this race like this, if you were in the race itself, how would you look for signs of weakness to strike at one of them? There's not much you can do, really, because, uh, you know, he's just got to keep pushing and everything and uh, run his best race and, and run evenly paced. He can't get carried away when he comes down to a small downhill or something like that. He's, uh, he's got his eye on him. John is a very crafty runner. And he ran smart. Two miles. Two miles to go, Billy. Well, because they went out so fast at the beginning, it's probably in John's favor. You know, he went out a little slower, so he's got maybe a little more reserves there. What's his kick like? But it's tough. If there's only two miles left, is that correct? 
Ten. There's two miles left, and uh, to make up 30 seconds is going to be very hard. Well, are you asking me, can't you look at that scenery, Bill Rogers, who's won this marathon four times and I tell me where the they course. are? I forget the course. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ikanga has very poignant memories of a race just like this last year, losing to Hussein by one second. There have been times. There's Tracy. There's been times, I think, Bud, when the Rockettes have been out of step more than those two guys when you oh, watch their, their oh, yeah. foot strike and the pounding on the ground. And isn't it phenomenal? This is a replay of last year. It is. And huh? here's Mekinen, crafty, letting him, uh, uh, Ikanga, worry about him. He's not showing up next to him saying, here I am, you can see how tired I am. He's sitting behind him saying, gee, I wonder if you're thinking how I'm feeling. I know you're struggling. <laughs> And he's going to put the hammer down at some point. The cast point. has changed slightly from 1988. It was Hussein and Ikanga and Tracy. Hussein, the champion, is gone. I think someone's got to make a move soon. You could see uh, a bit earlier, Mekinen looked behind to John Tracy. He doesn't want John to be right next to him. John is a very gritty runner. At the Olympic Games in 84 at L.A., he outsprinted Charlie Spedding on the track for the silver medal. This well, guy is tough. So he's going to have to make a move also, I think, to get away. That's a good point. Um, I think Kanga. that comes within the next mile, too. I mean, Ikanga, it, it, Mekinen, Tracy, that's the three. We're going to return a very short time as the Boston Marathon may become a three-man race. Grid Christensen from Norway maintains her first place standing and her world record pace, Barbara. Yes, she is maintaining that world record pace, although her um, pace over the last couple miles has dropped off significantly. Um, at mile 20, she was 148.15. Lisa Weidenbach was second um, at the 20-mile mark at 151.40, and Marguerite Buist, 152.22. So there's a significant gap between those first three runners. Surprisingly, in fourth is Kim Jones, also from the United States who's at 153.58, running a PR. What's happened to a PR? Personal, Personal record. record. I learned that today. I thought it was pretty running. Where's Joan Benoit Samuelson? Right now, they have Joan at the 20-mile mark in seventh place, um, still in the race, still running within herself, but obviously um, not running she's the not type win. of... No, she's not going to win. Will she finish? Uh, it apparently looks like she's attempting to finish now, so she's experiencing... The race difficulties, but not mechanical difficulties. Of the early pace. Exactly. So Christensen, with her distinctive white gloves, what a lady. Now let's return. She appears to be the winner. As we look at these two guys, dancing partners for miles and miles and miles, and nobody wants to give up. But it strikes me that Tracy is having trouble closing the gap. It's difficult to tell on television. If you see over the left shoulder there, you see two sticks of legs moving in the distance. He has not been able to close much down here as the runners are moving at about a 5.15 mile pace here. The athletes use a phrase after the race frequently in chatting with each other. They'll talk about the ability to maintain in the last part of a race. The body is made to cover 20 miles with the carbohydrates and the glycogen that you have in the stores. And your body switches to protein, and protein was not made to have you run fast. The body tightens up, and your mind cannot push your body any faster. You just continually slow down. It's a war of attrition. Uh, I often wish that Fidipides' race was actually 20 miles long and not 26. It would be a lot more fun for the marathoners. The original marathoner in 490 B.C., Fidipides, the dipper they called him. They said, win it for the dipper, and he did. The first marathon, going to <laughs> Athens for marathon to deliver the 6 o'clock news, the Greeks had won. Did you just make that up? What did I say? <laughs> John Tracy. <laughs> but I want to point out that uh, one of the reasons that John Tracy is only 17 seconds behind is that the leaders have slowed significantly in the ah. last two miles. They have gone from world record pace to about 2.08 minute pace, about a minute and a half off of uh, the pace that they well, needed. Well, what about world Boston record. record pace? Are we still on that road? Yes, it's we are. Oh, no, I'm sorry. 2.07.51 is uh, one of the top 10 times ever run by Di Casella. But 2.08.43, last year's winning time, was the second fastest time ever run. So now, Mekinen, this could be the is he a little ahead here? Mekinen, has he widened it? I don't think so, but he better start putting the screws down real soon. I don't think either one of them wants to come down to a sprint finish. John Tracy, in my opinion, has just got too much ground to make up. Three closest races, one second last year. We thought it would be closer. Two seconds, Salazar, and another two-second race. Well, we've got a barn burner here today. I love when a long race comes down to a foot, a foot sprint at the end. 
John Tracy's got too much to it's make up. Mekinen is pushing. Mekinen is yes, pushing. Sir. Yes, there's a surge going on right here. This is the attempt by Mekinen to break. We talked about it having to maybe get away and make sure Tra Tracy's not there. But here comes Mekinen making his final e move. Conga, who has lost so many agonizing races by seconds, even though he's one of the great marathoners. And there is some breathing room opened by Abeba. Mekinen, Ethiopia. Well, Ethiopia exports peanuts and coffee and leather goods and distance runners. I want to also point out that Ethiopia boycotted the Olympics last year. Emotionally, he has to be thinking, I did not have a chance at the Olympics last year when the rest of the guys were going for the gold. This is my Olympics. The Boston Good Olympics point, Craig. If you can't win Seoul, win Boston. There's an interesting thing going on in, Olymp in Ethiopia athletically. Their federation allows and has got an accommodation with the government to let their world-class marathoners compete around the world to show the athletic prowess. Meanwhile, the government says we will keep control of the Olympic Games and we will decide politically whether you ever go to the Olympics or not. Meanwhile, you can keep training, but you'll go to these meets. But He's you may never definitely opened it up. He's pried it open, Abeba Mekinen. And last year's runner-up has got to do something. We shall return to the last stages of the Boston Marathon, Ethiopia leading Tanzania. It's all African. Abeba Mekinen, Ethiopia has definitely taken the lead, and Craig Virgin, he looks the winner right now. Well, I think that cross-country background, which includes strength, is helping him right now. He handled the hills well. He didn't flinch. He didn't crumble. He put the pressure on, the conga couldn't answer. He's got about a 10 or 15 yard lead. That's not insurmountable in the last mile, but he's taking enough water, I don't think he's gonna cramp up. He conga, he and Mekinen dance cheek to cheek, like a stare in Rogers, for miles. But now Mekinen has pulled away. Mekinen was at mile mark 25, he was 203.10, and the conga was 203.20. So Mekinen has put 10 seconds on a conga oh in just boy. the last mile. Oh boy. When a move is made sometimes at this point, but it's very decisive. Now, Craig Virgin and Billy Rogers, you've both been here in these last, last yards. What is that crowd? Does the crowd lift you or do you even hear it? There's no question about it. It's just like, um, well, I don't know if there is anything comparable to it really because, uh, but I think, uh, I think Craig's mark is right on the money. This is coming into the Olympic Stadium. Uh, it's the only thing he's got. Know, because he lost the chance and uh, so this is a major major win for him and also it's the first time uh, second time an African wins and he's making up for a Bebe Bikila's loss here in 63. Well listen I know what it feels like to boycott an Olympics my best year was in 1980 80. the year that we didn't go to Moscow and I know the frustration this man must have felt last year and he's taking out that frustration on this course right now I'm estimating probably the second fastest time ever run on this Boston Marathon course, somewhere around 208. I talked to him, I said, do you know anything, did you ever see a Bibi Bikila run in 1960 and 64? He said, of course not, but he said, we all know about him, we all know about him, the barefoot marathoner, double gold medal winner in the Olympics, but this is Mekinen, get this name down. Not a Bibi, but a Bebe. Mekinen, and he is going to win for Ethiopia, gripped by politics, his country boycotting the Olympics, and he has his chance to glow in Boston. But I want to point out that he ran a real good race just last February in Tokyo. He won the Tokyo Marathon with a time, I think, somewhere in the, in the 208 range, Billy. 2833, I guess, yeah. So he obviously had a good race coming in, although that's stacking a marathon pretty close to another one, don't you think so? Uh, I didn't know they'd run this year and everything. I'm not sure. Do you run this year and all? I'm not sure. It, it could be. I don't know. Maybe I'm confusing 89 with 88. Well, but no, this he, guy is so he's strong. Ready for this obviously, one. he could have done it. <laughs> he's so strong. No, they've I split mean, him up. He, he ran at will. He played with these guys. I mean, it's like a college runner against a high school runner. I mean, look at second place. What, in a mile to do that at the end of a marathon? And, and one You've got to have marathoners. incredible strength to do that at the end of a, in the end of a marathon. But you were asking about the crowd. The crowd oh. it makes you, the, the winner always feels a lot better than the guy in, than the, than the guy in second place. I am betting that a conga might get passed by Tracy. When you fi when the elastic band finally breaks. The way I chased you, you Craig, get, in 1981. You I can see you stumbling. I, I didn't I look psyched. behind. <laughs> I didn't look behind because I couldn't do anything anyhow. But anyhow, if, if a conga is looking behind right now, I bet Tracy's got him dead on his sides. I wouldn't be surprised if Tracy comes in second. 
So Billy Rogers and Craig Virgin here. Virgin second in 1981. Billy Rogers one for the, Now there's the turn. Look at the speed this guy's moving at. I mean, he's picking up the pace. He's John Hereford, Billy, is that correct? Uh, no, this is just coming on to Boyle Street just coming now. On. He's going to make the long turn down the straightaway. Yes, now, I mean, he's on Hereford. He ran his 25th mile in 502, which goes to show you what kind of space he put on at Conga. Conga's there. I guess Tracy is not going to catch him. He's coming to this finish now. He's got the long straightaway now, and look at him move. 600 yards. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a great feeling when you can win first place in a big international competition like this. There is no pain at the this turn. point in time. There's the turn. Yep. There's all adrenaline. You're about, looking at the clock. Probably about a little over two minutes left, I would guess, for this straightaway. And I can tell you it's a long straightaway. It's very tough. You know? And back in second place is Juma Ikanga who was second last year, but by merely a second. He, he is soundly beaten this year. He shouldn't feel bad. No. Johnny, Johnny Kelly, the elder, finished second or something, I, I think something like... Seven times. Seven times? I mean, uh, he can talk to Johnny after the race, and he'll feel good. You know? Mekinen knows him a beer and dinner tonight for studying the pace for most of, most of this race, that's for sure. So, it's his... A long, lonely straightaway, but he's got to be looking at that finish line. Isn't it nice miles. to be alone at that point? I I'd think they're just over 208, if I'm reading the clock on the truck, just ahead of Mekinen. Abeba Mekinen. He's got to be thinking about all his countrymen that have won major races in the history of the marathon. But this is his. First Ethiopian to win the Boston Marathon. His <coughs> name will be Second carved in history. So, Mekinen. Probably likely to return next year, too, which makes uh, the other runners quake a little bit, I'll bet. <laughs> Down Boylston Street. Tracy's. And they're all on Boylston now, Mekinen, Ikanga, and Tracy. So this is really a rare finish, even though 1-2 is not that close, to have them all three within vision the last 600 yards. Tremendous finish of Boston. I wish we had a clock right now. He's going to be close to 2.08, just over. And the cheers for the Ethiopian. Thousands jammed along Boylston Street. Sunny day in Boston. The Blue Ribbon, he gets it both ways, breaking it and winning it. Just over 209, I think, which is a great time. Obviously, a little, a little bit of sun there. And maybe they went out too hard. I mean, I'm not sure. That split, a 101.52 half marathon split, that's phenomenal. 209.07 approximately was what his finish time was. We had some erroneous splits that last mile or two that may have set up our pace. And here comes second place right now. Jume Kanga, what a man he is. Same as last year and Tracy third like last year too. No surprise. So Tracy Mackin has that third place moved in. He was third in New York last fall as well. Mackinen takes the place of Ibrahim Hussein of Kenya who won it. He faded badly. It was a threesome for a long time. Ikanga, Mackinen, and Hussein. Hussein was the first to break. And John Tracy will come in very shortly, the Irishman. I hope Akanga can come back again because I think he, he deserves to win this race if he can hang on for one or two more years. There's our winner, giving a no fatigue, wreath. no problem. You know, look, the traditional award, no the laurel wreath, but there's more that goes with it now. A lot of cash as John Tracy will finish third, the Here Irishman. Comes John. John ran tough. I, he's, he'll be proud of himself, and the Kang will be proud of himself. They did their best. And that is the nitty-gritty of the marathon, no matter what your pace is. Ikanga, That's what this event is all about. It's not only coming in first. It's Ikanga, 48 pushing. seconds off the winning pace. Ikanga was 2.09.55, which is still a very fine time. It possibly got a little bit warm the last four or five miles, Bill. What do you think? I'm assuming that the problem, the change in the pace a little bit. And Ingrid also seems to have slowed down a lot in the last half. So no world record. Believe it or not, after all that fast pace, they still didn't beat Greg Meyer's time from 1983. Yeah, and no yeah. Boston record. Yeah. And Tracy's time was 210-24 for third place. So, one, two, three. There's much more of our marathon coverage coming. Larry Rossen will be talking to the winners. And the women's race is not yet finished. So, stay with us. We're in Boston where the running is happening. Ingrid Christensen and Barbara Bickford, how does she look to you now? Right now, Ingr Ingrid looks pretty good. She's um, recovered from that 555 mile at around 22 to 23 going up those hills. Our last mile was 532, um, 211 at the 24 mile mark. She's um, going to be buoyed by the crowd as they encourage the first woman 
uh, to finish the race, and she's hanging tough. Are we talking record anymore? No, right now um, we're not at a record pace, although it may be a Boston record. What are we shooting for there? The Boston record? Let's see, the Boston record for the women has got to be around 221. The so Ingrid Christensen still has a chance at it, and Larry Rawson is out on the street with the winner, Mekkinen. Larry. I don't have the winner. I have last year's winner, a man who certainly put up a great effort this year. Abraham, tell us what happened to you out there. You kind of fell back pretty early. Yeah, I think I feel bad. I'll stop one of them up. Because I feel now, did you hold together well in your own mind? Did you get some blisters you mentioned to me a minute ago? Yeah, I just feel some blisters because there's a place where you can go fight going up to here. Pouring it on. Now, what's the Boston record we're looking for? The Boston course record was Joan Benoit Samuelson's record of 222.43. And um, Ingrid still has a shot at that right now if the split times that we've been getting are correct. And just about where is she? Right now, I think she's approaching um, 25. She has maybe just actually a little over a, little a mile past, to go. Yeah. Barbara, she looks uh, a little bit tired in the legs. I don't see that lightness that we saw earlier. Do you think the hills took a lot out of her this race? I do think that the early pace probably took the most out of her, compounded by the hills. Right now, when you look at Ingrid, her shoulders are real tight, her arms are high, and um, her stride has shortened quite a bit. All right. There's no doubt about it. Ingrid Christensen of Norway is going to win the women's race. She's been in front from the very beginning in Hopkinton and has had nobody else in contention. We, of course, and I use that New England we, we're hoping that Joan Benoit Samuelson, who has won it twice, might push her. Joan couldn't keep it up. Lisa Weidenbach, another winner. Well, she came into a bit of contention, but not really, would you say, Barbara? No, the closest that Lisa was was in the um, Newton Lower Falls area when she was only two minutes behind Ingrid. Right now, Ingrid stretched that lead out to a little over three, and dependent upon what um, has been happening to Lisa in these last few miles, that mile gap may go. have been widened. A mile to go, and that's a welcome sign. I saw her just a few minutes ago wave to the crowd. Ingrid is much like Bjorn Bjorn. She doesn't show a lot of emotion, but and she smiled and grabbed for a hand. I thought she was going to give a high five there for a minute, but she is personable. Yes, she is. But I'll tell you what, she's a very effective runner right now. She Ooh. has destroyed the competition. Ingrid has been machine-like in her training, in her racing, her entire racing program. If there's any... Um, weak point that she's had in the past. It's been her mental preparation. Um, Larry mentioned earlier about her employing a sports psychologist, um, the motivational tapes, all of those things. Uh, Ingrid obviously has her mental game in stride with her physical ability now. Barbara, what's it going to take to beat her? Is someone going to have to be on her shoulder at where, 20 miles, 21 miles? Is that when she falls apart? Generally, in the past, at the shorter distances, um, if Ingrid has someone there with her at the halfway mark. She seems to be intimidated by that. It, it makes her lose concentration, and she's, um, you know, fallen apart, basically. Uh, she seems to have that under much better control. She's on Commonwealth Avenue, approaching Hereford, and then into Boylston. Now let's go down once more to Larry Rawson, who has the winner, Mekinen. microphone problem, but Larry has him and he'll keep him for a while. We're not going to let Mekinen go. The marathon, as we've tried to explain to you, is quite an undertaking in television and things do go wrong. There's nothing quite like it in sport in covering a marathon over 26 miles and 385 yards. Here's Christensen on Commonwealth Avenue. 
Ingrid's actually looking better now than she did a few minutes ago. Um, she is smiling more at the crowd. Her arms, or her shoulders have dropped, although her arms have remained high. I think she's starting to feel the relief of finishing this race. She knows that the 220 barrier is not attainable. Um, she's not worried about a course record. She just wanted the world re record. And um, I think she's enjoying this a little bit now. Well, it's a very enjoyable avenue, a mall running down the center. The back bay, you've heard that expression, away from Boston, it's all fill land, shortly after the Civil War. And it was a bay, and now a very fine residential area of Boston. But when I ran this last two miles, I almost got suffocated by the crowd in 1981. They have installed crowd control barriers that maintains that two-lane wide. It wasn't traffic. always that way, though. Well, I know. In some ways, it's a lift. In some ways, I felt like I was getting slightly claustrophobic. But, but she's got two full lanes. She can run down the middle. She just doesn't have to worry about anybody over her shoulder. The this only thing that's suffocating now is the noise of the crowd. And this is a holiday in Boston, Patriots Day. Paul Revere wrote on this day, 1775, reenactments of the first battles of the Revolution took place this morning in Lexington and Concord. Now let's see if our equipment is functioning well. Yeah, we pizza. are going to follow I thank, uh, Christensen. She still has a ways to go. Ingrid Christensen. This has got to be a good feeling, but uh -oh. I can tell from her steps that she's a little bit sore as she's going along. I think she's going to need a couple weeks to recover from this, bud. This well, has been I an all out think. effort. I would take a lifetime to recover from this, and never would. So Christensen's going to win it. Let's go to Larry Rossen once again with Abeba Mekinen. Our thanks to Coach Roba and also to Baby Mekinen for waiting with us a second here after the race. Coach, did you think that he had gone out too fast in the race? Yes, the first uh, 21K, it was fast. Uh, when I saw Tracy and the others are behind, far behind, so I said that it is too fast. So I, I was afraid that the finishing will be slower. A baby. Did you feel you had the race won in the last half? <laughs> because you have the sprinter's finish. Yeah. Congratulations to you and the Ethiopian teams that you have for doing so well at three different locations throughout the world this year. Back up to Bud. All right. Thank you, Larry Rawson. As we return to the course, the winner is Abeba Mekinen of Ethiopia. And people will be finishing for hours, perhaps days. If you want to fly into Boston, you'll be able to see a lot of marathoners finish today and tomorrow. They just keep on coming. There are probably 10,000 people in the race, more than 6,000 certified and accredited with some exemptions, and then a lot of other people they call the bandits or enthusiastic runners move right in. And here now is Ingrid in her white gloves. How close to a course record is she, Barbara? Um, Ingrid is not on course record pace anymore, I don't believe. Uh, if the splits that we've gotten, she has right now a four and a half minute lead over uh, Marguerite Buist of New Zealand. Um, Ingrid's coming in through the final um, line there. If we could possibly get a split screen, we've got a really good Here's picture on the our ribbon router. And Ingrid Christensen of Oslo. Just over the record. Just over, just a miss. Marguerite Buist is running very well right now in second, overtaking Lisa Weidenbach, I guess, at the 24 mile mark. And we should Buist be seeing a picture of Buist. Be seen. Here she comes. There she is. She looks very, very what strong right now, and she's obviously dressed for the weather. Her um, uniform is cut out on the sides, and um, she's probably not experiencing the heat difficulties that some of the other runners might have experienced. She's a Kiwi, though, huh? Well, she must have worked her way back up. So we'll see her finish soon, and we'll return to the streets of Boston and the 93rd running of the Boston Marathon. The winner is Christensen. <laughs> So, Marguerite Wiest of New Zealand. And New Zealand has a very fine Boston marathoning tradition. We've had two 
former winners, Lorraine Moeller in 1984 and Allison Rowe in 1981, New Zealanders, Kiwis, who have won the marathon, and Marguerite Wiest finishing very well. Marguerite may be a surprise to our um, American audience, but she has impressive credentials. She's run a 229.09 as her previous best, and um, earlier this year was second at the Nagoya Marathon. Has she come from a track background, Barbara? I really don't know that much about her. She doesn't race that often in the United States. Um, I know that she has a strong marathoning and road race background. Uh, we've been informed that Kim Jones has now turned onto Hereford Street. Kim is um, also hanging on to that Ingrid Jones tradition. She's a wife and mother. And she still has the presence to look at her watch as she turns the corner from Hereford Street into Boylston and only 600 yards to go. She had sunglasses on. I guess the sun is pretty bright out there, huh? It, um, it looks that the sun has been a factor. You've noticed that some of the um, runners in the close-up shots that we've gotten seem to have a little bit of sunburn on their shoulders. So it um, seems to be a factor in today's race. Uh, Kim Jones is a big surprise. Um, no one expected her to be their first American finisher with credentials like Lisa um, Weidenbach, Joan Benoit Sanderson, and Kathy O'Brien. Um, Kim has raced an incredible amount this year. She was second to Veronique Moreau of England at the Houston Tentacle Marathon January 15th. This is her second marathon already this year. Um, she then, two weeks later, competed at the U.S. Cross Country Trials for the World Cross Country Championships. And then she wanna, went on a series of PR performances, um, a 15K third place at Jacksonville River Run, a fourth in PR 10K time of 32.23 at Red Lobster, and a third place finish at the Nike Cherry Blossom 10 Mile, also in a PR time. So Kim um, was probably the only probably the only one picking herself to finish this high today. Well, wouldn't you say then, Craig and Barbara, that this woman is the upset kid of the marathon? We knew all these other names, and of course, Barbara, you knew Kim Jones, but to finish third from a pack like that and not really noted beforehand, that is a great performance for her. I want to point out that Boyce just crossed the finish line. I did not get a time on her, but she had to be about two minutes behind. Here we're looking at Kim Jones, Kim Jones finishing, and Kim looks very strong. She's finishing strong today, and this ought to be a PR performance for her also. Personal record, but I took her over the, I was her, her course tour guide on Friday. So evidently I must have done the right thing in showing her the course. I you showed her the right turn. You always do. You lead those women down the Primrose path, oh boy. don't you? 2.29.05 is the second place time of Marguerite Buist. And we'll have Kim Jones time for you momentarily. It is 2.29.36. 2.29.36 for the American Kim Jones, and we shall return to the marathon. Hey, she breaks the personal barrier. <laughs> this is true. You're getting this down good. I'm right? getting that jargon. Now, here comes Lisa Weidenbach. She just missed making the Olympic team again last year in the marathon. She was fourth in 84, fourth in 88 at the Olympic Trials Marathon, and she won Chicago last fall, right, Barbara? Right. Um, we can see a better picture of Lisa now. Um, her, she is definitely tight. She just turned around looking to see what's behind her. Um, I know that all she wants to do right now is finish this race. You can see the tightness in her calves, can't you? Well, Lisa is going to make it to fourth place, and we're going to make it right back into your living rooms after this. Ingrid Christensen has won the women's event of the Boston Marathon, and Larry Rossen is with her. Larry? Well, I'm with the queen, and she certainly ran well today. Tell us about there. Too hot for a world record for you? Yes, of course. Uh, it was too hot today, and... Uh, and uh, when I came to the little 25k, I just uh, tried to win the race, and that was the, the main reason for doing the race today. Did you make up your mind that it was too hot to try for a world record at the starting line or once in the race? No, not on the starting line. I feel it was really great in the weather condition when I, when I start. But uh, uh, after some miles, I felt it was a little bit too hot, and then I uh, tried to, to win the race. What point in the race did you decide that? Around 25k. 
You didn't worry about anybody catching you from behind when you were easing back at all? No, because I heard that the joiner was 20 seconds behind me for, for some, uh, up to four miles. And then the next time I heard something, it was there was one and a half minute behind. And then I thought, I keep going and I will beat them. So. You're the champ. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back up now to Bud Collins. All right, Larry Rawson, and he's right. She is the champ. Ingrid Christensen, and a woman who will receive, in the middle of your screen, wearing a white cap, one of the great ovations as she comes in, Joan Benoit Samuelson, who's been plagued by injuries. We question whether she would start the race, and once started, whether she would finish it. But she is finishing the race that she won 10 years ago, and then in 1983, the year before her Olympic gold medal performance in Los Angeles. Young mother from down Maine. She's paved the way for all those female runners ahead of her. Her victory in 84 set the, set the motion really for the women runners in America to come forward with fast times. Today was really a breakthrough day for women's American marathoning. Um, not only did Kim Jones also go under the 230 barrier, but the fact that Joan Samuelson is the third American instead of number one um, has got to be a mental boost for all of those aspiring female marathoners out there. Um, they, they've realized today that Joan is not unbeatable, and um, it just gives them that much more to shoot for in well, the future. She's a mother figure not only for her daughter Abigail, but for all those female runners. You're absolutely right, Craig. In all fairness, though, I have to point out uh, that Joan has only run one or two races this last six months. Her 10K that she ran just last month was not really that impressive. It was okay. So she really wasn't peaked for this race. I think it may take her another six six months really to be in good racing form to be able to challenge him. What again. Bud just indicated um, was really important. Uh, Joan is a, a very much a public figure and there is a lot of public pressure on her. Uh, since 1984, the moment she won that Olympic gold medal for the first women's marathon ever, she has been in the spotlight now, and, and it's a difficult hold to take. Barbara, let's go down to Larry with one of my favorites, Priscilla Welch. She's 44, won the Women's Masters, and gave her husband David a 46th birthday present today. Four. She said, I'm not a bit tired. Just a little canter, just a little cash, and just a little cheering for Priscilla Welch. So I like to see her run. I think she's a marvelous woman. And we shall return to the Boston Marathon after this. Well, there is cash involved in the Boston Marathon. It is open to professionals. It is open to everybody. And one great thing about it, equal prize money for men and women. So the men's Masters winner picked up another 10000 in there, didn't he? Yeah, Campbell, by finishing fifth. And an added pleasure is that New England cellular, cellular phone one of New England has stood by the finish line and offered each of these people a free call home. Now, I saw E.T. at Newton Lower Falls. He'll be in soon, and he'll be calling home on cellular phone of New England. So that is the way it stands at the moment, and there are more people finishing this marathon. As I say, you can fly into Boston and see a genuine marathoner finish before your very eyes. There'll be hundreds and thousands of them yet to come. Here are your primary results for the Boston Marathon 93rd running. The first Ethiopian champion, Abeba Mekanen. Not quite a record, but a wonderful race. Last year's number two man from Tanzania repeats, Juma Ikanga. Last year's number three from Ireland, John Tracy is number three again, but last year's champion, Ibrahim Hussein of Kenya, slips to fourth place. Still money involved, he'll be okay. And the mood down here is, that while it takes dedication and almost a maniacal goal to set a world record today, is that the elements and the course won. We had a chance for two world records. It didn't occur. The athletes coming across here are telling me right now that the temperature won and the course defeated them in the second half. We saw a world record pace, and it was not to be this year because this turned out to be the warmest day in Boston in about three weeks. It was in the 60s. I remember here this mood and this feeling. These athletes are really struck with the effort they put forth. It was not to be. There are very few PRs here today in this sunshine. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. Let's get back upstairs. So I can't imagine that Larry Ross will go right out and run the marathon backwards. We'll see him in Hopkinton sometime tomorrow. That's our show.
Christensen of Norway, England. What a wonderful young mother she is in her white gloves, so proper, so very Brahmin and Bostonian is the winner. And then from Africa, Abeba Mekinen has won for his country. Ethiopia has never had a champion. Those are the champions of Boston today. The 1989 Boston Marathon on Sports Channel. Michael, you're in the way. No, that's Remember, okay. that's good. Have out since 6800. Where's the number? Actually, how are you? Looks like a runner. He's built. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll run. Diane. I can run to the back. He's built like he could be a. I mean, he's built like that. Wait, what's your VIP number? Wait, he's taking his seat. I made it this way. He's waiting for his number. This is a proud moment. He's waiting for his number. I would say I'm father of the of the young man. Get in there. Go with Mike and my proud mother. There we go. That's it. Mr. Cohen with the Boston Marathon. How do you do, sir? Proud parents. What TV program are we going to be on? Wait, you got to get a picture of this. This is Goober. Hey, Goober. This is Jesse Fligo over here. And Jesse's daughter. Sarah, say hello. The proud father of the son who's going to be as a proud father of the runner who's going to be competing in the Boston Marathon. I'm very happy on this very, very special occasion. Especially coming back home to see Howard and Diane and Brother Sam and Edith. Uh, we have to get diaper pins across the way. Can you make a copy of your, your film when you're all done and we'll pay you and send it to Milwaukee? Because I have a VCR. Yeah, what I have to do though is I have to. Actually, close to the shuttle buses near Hoppington, just before the race, two hours before the race, and there's Mike, looking real good. He's ready to go. <laughs> All right, Mike. <laughs> Where's their present? Bring it out. Wait, can I see this? All right. We had to bring a little memento of where we're from. I know they don't match too well, but these are patriotic. We got a blue shirt right here to Wisconsin. Oh, that's All right. great. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. Wisconsin badger on it. I love it. Oh, nice. All right. I can't see the colors, but it, it certainly looks good. That's beautiful. Thanks, Mike. Here you go. Get a, get a look at that. <laughs> oh boy, look at that. Wisconsin in, in full bloom there. And now I got a, some stranger's car. <laughs> you have to turn around so we see the fast marathon. We're really in Upton now, so it's going to be a few miles down the road. And there's okay, Amy. I'm taking. You Hi, can't Amy. take a. <laughs> this is a very proud Diane. moment, folks. Uh, <laughs>
Did you hear us? What? Did you hear us? I didn't hear, I heard the massive yeah, scream. Yeah. 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 Number one coming with that cap on. I didn't think you did. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How did you go? I did it. I know. Very good. Way over here. The first time, the last time. Really? Where are you? I'm coming to the planner. Okay, Michael. Let's go. I don't know you. Michael, hurry up. Should I do your name? Okay. Where are you going?